lift our hands and worship the Lord. your brother's keeper. It's very important, very important that we be our brother's keeper. This is going to become more important in the days that are ahead. Would you just please walk around a little bit and greet your brothers and sisters and if there are any guests Come day soon, darling. Don't worry. One day soon. We're going to ask us to stand. We're going to turn our Bibles to two passages. Psalm 138 
Psalm 138 and verse 6. I'd like for us to read that together. Psalm 138, verse 6. Let's go. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. The Amplified Bible renders the verse in this way. For though the Lord is high, yet has he respect to the lowly, bringing them into fellowship with him. But the proud and haughty he knows and recognizes only at a distance. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want the Lord to recognize me only at a distance. Because there can be no fellowship for those who the Lord knows at a distance. Isaiah 66, verses 1 to 2. Let's read that together. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. The Amplified Bible has it this way. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? And what kind can be my resting place? For all these things my hand has made, and so... All these things have come into being by and for me, says the Lord. But this is the man to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken or wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. I think what the Lord is saying to us in this verse is that for a man to tremble at his word and respect his commandments, that man must be humble and of a broken or wounded spirit and our subject is pride the Christian's greatest enemy the Christian's greatest enemy pride pride and lesson number one which we will consider this evening is the man that God regards, the man that God regards. Would you like to be a person that God regards? 
You may be seated, please. In Isaiah 66, God rebukes the plan of the Jews who are returning from exile in Babylon of rebuilding the temple and reestablishing the temple worship. And he rebukes them because they were lacking in sincerity and a spirit of holiness. They just wanted to build a building. And you know that you can build you can build buildings and say you are doing it for the glory of God and not really do it for the glory of God. You know that that's true, right? And we can serve if in an office in the church and say we are doing it as unto the Lord, but we're really doing it to ourselves, right? You know that, right? And sometimes, well, see, God warned them that mere formal outward worship is an abomination to him. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have in the church come to judge our holiness by external uh, devices, very unfortunately. And we, we, we look at somebody and just by how they appear outwardly, we make a judgment as to whether they are right with God or not. Is it true, brethren? Uh, I'm so troublesome, you know. I'm, I'm feeling in such a troublesome mood. And I, let, me, let me see if I can do this. Let me... Let me gauge, let me try at this and see if we can just get down to brass tacks. Let's see now. When you, for instance, if you, for instance, saw a man who had a beard, wouldn't your first thought be that he's not saved? How many would think so first, first off? All right, I guess I better go a different route. Uh, turn to the book of Judges for me. Let me sh illustrate the point that, I, I, of course, I didn't plan to say this, but it just occurred to me. I'll find it for you in a little while. Judges, judges, I know it is judges. Judges chapter 17. If you could put that up for me. Judges chapter 17. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee about which thou cursedst and spakest of also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. So he's saying, I was the one who took your silver. You were cursing about it. I was the one who took it. 
And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. So this lady had dedicated the silver unto the Lord. That's what she said. She had dedicated the silver unto the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? Huh? When you get a new car, don't you say you dedicate it unto the Lord? Yes. And when you get a new house, don't we say we dedicate it unto the Lord? Yes. Well, this lady got silver, and she dedicated the silver unto the Lord. To do what? To make something that is an abomination to the Lord. A graven image and a molten image. Well, I guess it would be easy for us to condemn her and say, what a hypocrite. Well, the car that we say was dedicated to the Lord. How often does that car do the Lord's work? I'm not saying it doesn't, you know, I'm only asking. The house that was dedicated unto the Lord. Is it truly so? The church building that was dedicated unto the Lord, the keyboard and the uh, organ, the drum set, the pool, the microphones, the computer equipment, the cameras, are they being used in a manner that would glorify the Lord? Uh, I who say I am a Christian and dedicated unto the Lord, am I living my life in a way that indicates that that is true? Or am I taking that which I say is dedicated unto the Lord and using it to make that which the Lord hates and his word condemns um, it's so very important for us brothers and sisters to severely severely monitor our motives very important for us to severely to critically monitor our motives is not very difficult to do the right thing for the wrong reason not very difficult and if you've been in church for a little while, you learn how to do church. All right. So heaven is God's throne. And earth is his footstool. God cannot be confined to any human structure. It's not possible to confine God to any human structure. It is not possible. Even the wonderful temple in Jerusalem that Solomon built was inadequate for a God who is omnipresent. And Solomon understood this because in 2 Chronicles 6.18 he prayed in his dedicatory prayer for the temple. He said, but will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house, 
which I have built. The whole heavens is not big enough to contain you. So when I say this is the house of God, I, you know, what am I really saying? In Acts 7.48, the Apostle Paul said, How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. That's a serious thing, you know, brethren. That's a serious thing. And I never forget one day, years ago, when I used to teach at the Bible school, a uh, pastor and I were talking and he hit the wall like this with his hand. And he said, John, this is not the church. Hit the wall of the Bible school. And he said, that is not the church. And then he pinched me and said, that's the church. The Lord, the Most High, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And this, Paul said, this is what the prophet said. So it's, it's this, it's an it's a old covenant. Doctrine is not just new covenant. From Old Testament times, God's primary concern wasn't a building. In Psalm 113, 46, the psalmist said, The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? God is so great that he has to humble himself to look at the things that he has created. He has to condescend to sit on his own throne. For God to confine himself to sit on a throne takes a lot of humility. <laughs> it's not a throne that somebody else built, you know. His own throne for God to limit himself. To sit on his own throne takes a lot of humility because he's so big. So he says, where is this house you're going to build for me? What manner of house is it that you intend to build for me? In the first place, God does not need a house to dwell in. And secondly, those who are lacking in sincerity and true holiness cannot build him a house that could be in any way worthy of him. And that is the real ground of the refusal. God is saying, "You right now you are not in a position to even try to build a house for me. You don't, don't even touch it. God says, all these things hath mine hand made and all those things have been. So he's informing us that the heavens... And the earth were created by him. He brought everything into existence. How then can he need any man to build a house for him? If indeed God had required a house to dwell in, he would have made one when he made the world. But what kind of house would that be? Because how could God hold in it? For he said, the heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. So when God sits down in heaven, one man many years ago stood up, and stood up to testify and said, the earth is Jesus' hassock. And that was true. If he had made one, if God had made a house, who could have destroyed it? It would have continued until today. So that he would have no need of a temple made with hands. Perhaps God is also here speaking to the finiteness of man, the limitation of man. Are you planning to use material that I have created to build a house for me? 
He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. That's what Psalm 2 says. The Lord shall have them in derision. But suddenly, suddenly, you read that psalm. Sorry, Isaiah 66. Suddenly, as though God softens and his mood alters. It's as if his mood changes. We're just... Seconds ago, he was rebuking insincere, hypocritical, ungodly men. He finishes his sentence with an almost plaintive, poignant longing in his voice. But to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He's saying, you can't build a house for me. Don't even think about it. What kind of house could people like you build for me? And then suddenly he just changes and he says, but to this man will I look. I, I, I'll tell you where I really want to dwell. I'll tell you where I really want to come and set up my abode. You are thinking about building a house for me. Ask me what kind of house I want. Ask me. Don't tell me that you want to build a house for me. Ask me. Lord, what kind of house do you want? What an amazing statement. The almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, holy, righteous God is looking for a human being. He says, to this man will I look. The word look is the translation of the Hebrew word. It's pronounced norbat, which means to scan. That is to look intently at. By implication, it means to regard with pleasure, favor, or care. The first use of this term is in Genesis 15:5, where God commands Abraham, look. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. In that instance, it is used in the sense of behold, consider, take a good look. For Abraham to try to even number the stars, he would have to look for a long time. God says, look, I want you to attempt something for me, Abraham. Look, so while Nabat is commonly used as physical looking, the word is frequently used in a figurative sense to mean a spiritual and inner understanding and perception. Look, look, spiritual and inner understanding and perception. It is used in the sense of having respect or regard for. In our text, Isaiah 66, when God says, to this man will I look, he's using the word in a figurative sense. He says, in effect, there are persons whose attitude I respect regard and esteem there are persons who I am unable to ignore there are persons who attract and keep my attention there are persons whose fellowship I desire Imagine God 
saying there are persons I want to be around. There are persons who I find irresistible. I can't resist them. Wherever I see them, I, I must be near them. There are persons who are special to me. There are persons who I delight to live in and walk in and make my abode with. These are persons who live in humility, brokenness, and an utter dependency on me, and who reverence my word. God is not seeking for a magnificent building to dwell in. He's looking for a humble, broken man. See, brethren, our culture teaches us to respect that which is outward. Our culture teaches us, you know, we, we respect persons who have achieved academic excellence. We respect persons who have risen to the top in their profession. We respect persons who outwardly seem to have everything going for them. And very often people in this country, for instance, who have done significant things are not regarded. Have you ever heard of a man, any, any of you, have you ever heard of a man called T.P. Lecky? Ever heard of him? How many have heard of him? Put up your hand. Not many of us. A good number, but not the majority of us. How many of us have heard of Usain Bolt? Up your hand. T.P. Lecky developed a strain of cattle, of cows, a Jamaican man that would do best in conditions that we have here. These cows have a probably the primary cows that are used in Venezuela and other parts of the world like that. But not many people know his name. Because really, what's so big about that? Developing better cows. But, but, but what is God looking for? What, what is God looking for? I, 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 I... I, I would, I desire to see what we call the house of God looking good. I, 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 be, I believe we need to make this place look excellent. I really believe that. But really, what God is looking for is a man or a woman, a boy, or a girl who will live in brokenness and vulnerability and utter dependency before him. 
He's saying, I'm looking for that person. I find, I am drawn to that person. So, God seems to be saying in effect that even if it were possible for a building to be constructed that would be worthy of his regard, he would not pay as much attention to it or take as great delight in it as he would to a humble, penitent, broken heart. Indeed, he has a heaven and a earth of his own making and various houses of worship all over the world. But he overlooks them all in order to seek for an individual who is poor in spirit, humble and self-denying, whose heart is truly contrite for sin who is grieved for having grieved God and who desires nothing so much as to be forgiven so that he can be right with God he's seeking for an individual who does not disregard his word but who has a habitual awe of God's majesty and purity and the habitual dread of his justice and wrath. Such a heart is a living temple for God. It is in such a house that God desires to dwell. Such a heart is like heaven and earth, God's throne and his footstool. And so perhaps if we understand this, we will better understand the song that says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary living sanctuary for you how many want to be a sanctuary for God many years before the prophet Isaiah received this revelation, David wrote these words in Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. This verse, it underlines Isaiah 66, verse 1 to 2, but it also adds a very important contrasting truth. God does draw near to the humble, but he is also disgusted and repelled by pride. And he keeps the proud at a distance from himself. There is absolutely no possibility of close contact or true fellowship between God and a proud person. I want to read that again. There is absolutely no possibility of close contact our true fellowship between God and a proud person. No possibility. Now, folks, the, 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 the danger with this, 
if you remember the story of the two men who went into the synagogue to pray. Remember that parable Jesus told? Pharisee and the publican. And Jesus said the Pharisee, he first prayed and Jesus said he, he prayed thus with himself. His prayer sounded very eloquent. But Jesus said he prayed with himself. He prayed with himself. Brethren, the times are too desperate for me to pray with myself. Hold on. The publican now. The publican Publican, publican was there in a little corner and the publican couldn't even do this. Couldn't even look up. The depth of his depravity and the consciousness of his sin and his resultant unworthiness oppressed him. Have you read in the Psalms where David says, my sins are very heavy, I cannot look up. But he smote upon his breast. He said, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. So the Bible says, the Bible says, listen now folks, the Bible says that the publican went home justified. Listen carefully. I'm trying to get us to see the danger of pride, the real danger of pride. The Bible didn't say that the publican went home feeling justified. It says he went home justified. God forgave him, pardoned him, and wiped the slate clean. Maybe he went home still conscious of his unworthiness. But Jesus is stating that a fact occurred. He went home justified. As far as God was concerned, the man was clean. This man, the Pharisee, after his prayer, he went home feeling that he was right with God. That's the danger of pride. He went home and said, I had a wonderful time in prayer this morning. But God didn't even hear him. The publican might have felt like his prayer was bouncing off the ceiling. The Pharisee no doubt felt that from he said the first word. Central picked up. In fact, it wouldn't have occurred. This Pharisee wouldn't have needed the song Central's never busy. Always on the line. He knew that. Pride is so deceptive 
that you can get up off your knees feeling justified. While you are so far from being justified that God, God didn't even, wasn't even around. It's how dangerous pride is. God does know the proud, but he knows them from afar. He has no intimacy with the proud. He knows them from afar. And he has them in utter derision. It does not matter how much they may boast about having the favor of God. He knows them, but disowns and rejects them. He does not draw near to them, much less make his abode with them, but leaves them to themselves until they are ripe for judgment. There is absolutely no possibility of close contact or true fellowship between God and a proud person. So, because a man or a woman is a great preacher or teacher, doesn't mean that they are close to God. If they are dominated by pride, they are, God knows them afar off. No, folks, I, you know, I, you know, when I came to church, I used to hear God can't use an unclean vessel. God uses any vessel he wants. God uses any vessel he wants. Some of us, have been rebuked by unsafe people. Sometimes unsafe people have been used of God to speak to us. God uses anybody he wants. Now, what we need to say is that God will not fellowship with certain people. He will not put his stamp of approval on certain people. Certain people will never have fellowship with God if they remain in that condition. But we are not able to say God can't use them. You, don't, you, are not, you are not that bright to know the mind of God. If God can use a donkey, he can use any human being he wants. And folks, whether you want to believe it or not, God looked at Nebuchadnezzar a wicked king and called him my servant. Pride. You know, pride. We're, we're going to be exploring it for a few weeks. This is just the introduction. It's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. These statements reflect a spiritual law that holds true for Christians and non-Christians alike. This law is outlined in James chapter 4 verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The New American Standard Bible renders the verse as follows. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed 
to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And Jerome said, think, brother, what a sin it must be which has God for its opponent. God resisted the proud. You know, it's not, it is not necessarily fornication per se that keeps us from the presence of God. It is the pride that refuses to make us break that keeps us from God. Pride that causes me to cover it up. God resisted the proud. Think about that, folks. A man is trying to get to God. He decides to have his own all-night prayer meeting. And he prays through the night. And all the while he's praying. God is because he never gets to a place of brokenness all night long and he's speaking in tongues God resisted the problem He gives grace. Grace. When God sees brokenness. Well, I was going to say when God sees brokenness, he opens the door and says, come. But rather when God sees brokenness, he opens the door and comes down. As he finds it irresistible. Give us more grace. You resist the proud. So the funny thing about pride in a folks, every single one of us in here every single last one of us in here if you were to ask us is there pride in the church every one of us would say yes but if we were to be asked are you proud See, pride is in the church but it's not me Envy is in the church, but it's not me. But biting is in the church, but it's not me. It's none of us, but it's in the church. Must be the demons, eh? I tell you, brethren, we have more to fear from the demon that looks back at us in the mirror than any other demon. It seems very unfortunately, it seems that most Christians have a perspective of pride which is so superficial, so light, that it renders us incapable of detecting its presence in our own lives. We easily detect pride in the lives of Hollywood actors, entertainers, sports stars, co-workers, church members, preachers of LA. But most of us would probably deny that we struggle with pride. How many persons ever confess to their pastor that they have a problem with pride?
Nobody has ever told me that. Not one person I can recall has ever told me that. People tell me they have a problem with lust, problem with this, problem with that, problem with everything. Never with pride. And the thing is so subtle that they don't know that back of all the problem they're having with lust and everything else is... You ever, have you ever noticed how you spell pride? Spell pride. What is in the middle? If you take out the I, what do you get? Prude. It doesn't sound too bad. Prude. It's like sin. If you take out the I, listen, we can't live with that. That's not two bodies. Anybody can live with sin. But once, see, that, that's the problem in a brethren. Once I come in, one, once I am involved, we have a problem. Once the I in me is involved, a problem develops. And I've, I've said this oftentimes to us that, you know, if, if we really want to have, <laughs> if, if we really want to have a pristine holy church, like now if we wanted to do it right now, we could do it in about eh, five, ten minutes. You know, just all of us come out of the building then the church would be holy. But you see, the first man that comes in, <laughs> he comes in having, f he has fallen short of the glory of God. I've said this to us many times before. A consciousness of your own unworthiness. A consciousness of your own personal depravity may be a powerful signal that you are getting closer to God. See, the Pharisee, he did not have a consciousness of his own unworthiness. And if you, you see those Pharisees, they thought they were a bag of chips and all that. And they were the only persons in the Bible that Jesus condemned. Brethren, Hope you, are you reading the Bible and taking it seriously? When Jesus says the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of heaven before you, that's a serious thing, you know, because these were church people that knew the Bible inside out. So what has gone wrong? You think it can happen to us? Why not? You see, some of the things that we do and say is modesty is pride in extremes. Some of us are so proud that we can't live in vulnerability and brokenness. And we think it's humility.
whether or not we recognize its presence, the truth is that pride lurks within the heart of every human being. In fact, it permeates our fallen human nature. Touch yourself and say, it is in me. Pride is a corrosive agent. It's like acid. It eats away at what is on the inside. If it is not dealt with, it will eat away at one's soul and ultimately destroy it. Every sincere Christian needs to take a personal inventory of their life. And be willing to have every dimension of pride exposed and dealt with in order to attract the special attention of God. Every dimension of pride needs to be exposed. Every dimension of pride. Every dimension of pride. As difficult and painful as this process may be, it is absolutely necessary if we are to achieve true humility. It is only when we acknowledge and come to grips with the pride in our own lives that we are ready to examine the subject of humility. We can't even begin to talk about humility unless and until we understand how full of pride we are. I've, I've used this illustration before. Have you? It's, it's amazing to me. I've, I've often said that the Apostle Paul is one of my favorite characters. I, 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 am, I am drawn to persons who are real. I am drawn to persons who live in a real world and live a real life. I am drawn to persons who grapple with life. So people like Paul and David are very fascinating for me. You know, Paul didn't hide away from life. Paul, Paul, Paul knew more about the athletic games than many people. And I asked myself, how did he know so much? Paul knew about defeat. He, when he was in Athens, he, he, he could quote to the Greeks there poems that their own poets had written. Where did Paul learn that? But, but Paul, Paul, and, and, and it's remarkable. And one of the things we're trying to do, brethren, if you have been participating, and I can only make recommendations. I really don't have the power to force anybody to do anything. I just believe that, you know, I try to, I try to listen and then say to God's people. 
But we have been trying to read the Bible in chronological order. So, we've been trying to... It, it, one of the amazing things is to look at Paul's epistles in date order and see the progression in his thought and the progression in his understanding of his own personality and character and, and his ability as he goes on to identify weaknesses in his own life. I find that fascinating. So, early in his ministry, well, not very early, but early in his, fairly early in his writing of epistles, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I am, what does he say? I am the least of the apostles, right? Now, Now, Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles, which is a pretty humble statement, wouldn't you say? He didn't say, I'm the greatest of the apostles, although he said, you know, he said in that same passage, he said, I I've worked harder than all of them. <laughs> but he says, I'm the least of the apostles, and he said, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. See, Paul could never get rid of that from his mind. He, he knew he had been justified and he knew he had been washed, but in his mind he always said, he, in fact, he said in First Timothy that the real reason why God saved me, in, in First Timothy chapter 1, he said, the real reason why God saved me is to demonstrate to everybody his saving power. Because when you think about me, you must understand that he can save anybody. Paul said, that's really the reason why I am saved. Because God wanted an example of just a wretch. He wanted an example of just if a man will persecute the church, then who else are you going to find? So God said, let me save him to show people that my grace. If I can save Paul. So he says, I'm the least of the apostles. Then, well, you might not count this as one, but Later in Romans chapter 7, he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, well, no good thing. Paul said, I know that. I know that. I know that. Then, in the book of Ephesians, now he says, I who am less than the least of all the saints. I, who am less than the least of all the saints. So first he said, I'm the least of the apostles. Now he says, He's gone down to the saints and says, I'm not the least of the saints. I'm less than you'd barely regard me as a saint. Just think of the least saint. I am a rung below. And then and you have asked yourself, what is happening to Paul? Don't he should be seeing himself in a better light? In one sense, he sees himself in a better light, you know. A much better light. He's appreciating more and more what God has done for him. That's very clear in his writings. But also, he's seeing something else. And his final assessment a little before his death in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said, this is a faithful saying. 
worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Not was, of whom I am chief. What's happening, Paul? Well, really, the basic way I can tell you is that I'm drawing closer to the light. And the more I come to the light, is the more messy I look. When I started, I never knew spots were over here. Now the light is showing me up. I don't like what I see. Part of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Strange that some of us, the longer we live for God, is the more we feel worthy. That we should be here. And the fact that I've been saved for 40 years gives me some entitlement. Brethren, Calvary must always be a wonder to us. We, we must always be in awe of Calvary. So, let's look at this little, this little stupidness here. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. I cheat you of the abiding presence of God because I make you repulsive to him. I, God can't dwell with you because, because the pride that is in you makes you repulsive to God. I'm a cheater. I'm a cheater. I cheat you of your God-given destiny because I make you demand your own way. Because of me, you did not wait for what God had in store for you. Because of me, I pride, I, I cheated you from what God really had in store for you and now you have to settle for second best because you can't change again God, that would make it worse you have to stay with what you have now pride, I'm a cheater I cheat you of contentment because I make you think that you deserve Better than this. I shouldn't be living here. I shouldn't be working here. I shouldn't be driving this type of car. I shouldn't be taking bus. So who are really you? You shouldn't even be alive. You shouldn't even be alive to complain that you shouldn't be taking bus. All of us should be roasting in a devil's hell. I cheat you of knowledge because I make you believe that you already know it all. That's a big problem for some of us, you know. Some of us sitting right here are at the present time unteachable. 
especially if the teaching does not square with what we believe. Even if it's true, if it opposes what you believe, even what you believe is wrong, you're going to reject it. Because of pride. Because of pride. Because it couldn't be that I've believed the wrong thing all these years. I cheat you of healing because you are too full of me to forgive. And I can't heal you while there is unforgiveness in your heart. Pride is causing you not to be able to forgive. So I can't heal you either physically or spiritually. So you're praying and fasting for your healing. And you're sent to Benny Hinn and T.D. Jakes. And you still can't get healing. And if it was possible for you to pay money that Oral Roberts could come out of the grave. And those great healers. You would have paid the money. But I can't touch you. Can't touch you. I cheat you of holiness because I make you refuse to admit that you are wrong. So until you admit that you are wrong, how can I make you holy? I cheat you of vision because I make it easier for you to look in the mirror than out of the window. That's a big problem with the church in the Western world. The church in the Western world is looking in the mirror. <laughs> and saying, why we can't have revival? While the churches in Africa and Asia, in the Eastern world, are having revival because them not have Nothing to look in mirror about. So them looking through window and seeing the lost. And we can only see ourselves as individuals. Can't look at nobody else or nothing else. Just me. Pride again. Cheat us of vision. I cheat you of genuine friendship because I won't allow you to let people know the real you. There are persons in this church that have no real genuine friends. We have good acquaintances. We have people that we can call. But some of us will never make ourselves vulnerable to others. Because we have to keep up appearances. So we don't have no genuine friends. Because the only way, the only way to test friendship, real friendship, is when you are vulnerable. A friend love it at all times. That's the only way to know who is your friend if that person loves you at all times. And a brother is born for what? Adversity. That's what Solomon said. A friend love it at all times. Hello. When Solomon said there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, he was not talking about Jesus. It wasn't prophecy. Solomon was saying that there are friends in life who are closer to us than our very brothers. We said closer than a brother. Nothing not wrong with that. Because Jesus is really a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Although he's our brother too. 
But when Solomon spoke that he wasn't thinking about Jesus, Solomon was testifying to a fact that there are friends who rally around us when we are in trouble more than our very relatives. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Folks, don't go away and say, Pastor, say that we shouldn't sing the song that way. Do. For boy, I am so easy to be misunderstood. Sing it. In fact, sing it on Sunday. Let's just get over it so that If you even look at the context, you can see that it wasn't really talking about Jesus. A man that had friends must show himself friendly. So, brethren, this is a serious one. Difficult for me to make myself vulnerable, brother Glenn. Because if I tell you who John Mark is, you're going to say, then are you a pastor me? Strange that we know everything about Peter almost, eh? And Peter was bigger than the pastor. Peter had the keys. No, so. But all when Peter was opening the doors, Peter had prejudice and bias in his heart. But nobody would have a problem with that because it's Peter. You wish it was you in Peter? No, I don't hear nobody complain that the big Peter with the keys, the big apostle Peter, was so biased and prejudiced. No, but it's Peter. But our leaders, we, we, they must make no mistake. But Peter can make mistake. But God just threw open the door on Peter's life. But we still love Peter. And you know what? So we, we, we taught about the incarnation in Bible study about two years ago. But as I'm saying on Sunday, most of us were not here, so I have to teach it on Sunday. I cheat you of love because I make it impossible for you to make sacrifices. And real love demands sacrifices. Pride does that. Cheats us of love. Cheats us of love. I cheat you of deliverance and victory. Because I make you focus on me in others. While blinding your eyes to me inside you. So you and I are so busy. Casting out demons out of people. And blooding up people. And seeing the moat in people. Why we don't see the beam in us. Robert Burns the Scottish poet said, oh, would some power the gift the give us to see ourselves as others see us? So I might see myself one way. And it might, I might look good to myself. But is that the true picture? I cheat you of greatness in heaven. Cheat you of greatness in heaven because I make it difficult for you to wash people's feet on earth. The way to be great in heaven is to be great on earth. And the way to be great on earth is to be a slave to others. But pride says, I can't wash his feet. 
Folks, what we do at Lord Supper is nonsense sometimes, you know. It's just a ritual. So when we tell you to imagine that you're washing the feet of Jesus, it's because we want to inc- and look for a person that's not your friend. It's just, a, it's just a ritual we go through. And I know of one Pentecostal pastor, he said to me, Brother John, I cut it out, you know. I did not, not it's, what it doing? You wash people's foot one day and then you treat them bad. You, 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 can't, you can't humble yourself to them. You just, and you, 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 you wish, you're hoping and praying that the foot not smell too bad. But, but, but Paul said, Paul said, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, look, Paul was serious. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I don't want you to take the church money and help every widow. That's what Paul said. He said, those that have family, let them look after their relatives. Don't use the church money and help those who have relatives that can look after them. He said, the younger widows, don't count them in the number. Refuse them. Don't give them charity because they're going to marry again. Folks, you don't believe me. First Timothy chapter 5, read it. Don't take my words for it. He said, these are the widows that I want you to to look after. Go down a little more. Brethren, not one. First Timothy 5, go to, all right. Go up a little bit. Go to, go to verse 4. Go to verse 3. It, it, we need to read these things. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Yes. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety or godliness at home and to requite their parents for that is good and acceptable before God. Yes. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusted in God and continued in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You wouldn't like to have Paul as a pastor, you know. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three square years old. Paul says she must be 60, at least. Having, having been the wife of one man. Yes. Well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children. If she have had strangers, if she have washed saints' feet. See the little foot washing that we go on, which is a ritual now. But in those days, when the saints came in weary and tired from walking, somebody had to come and take the basin. He wouldn't put that as anything to remember. Western church, that is not greatness. If she have washed the saints' feet. No, if, if, he had, if he had taught many Bible studies and written many books. If she have relieved the afflicted. If she have 
diligently followed every good work. Paul says, Paul says, those are the widows that the church must help. <laughs> I cheat you of God's glory because I convince you to always seek your own glory. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. You love me because I make you believe that I'm always looking out for you and thinking about what is in your best interest. But that is not true. In reality, I am always looking to make a fool of you. I pretend to be your friend when in reality I am your greatest enemy. If you remain friends with me, you will never know how much God has for you. If you do not rid yourself of me, I will eventually damn your soul in hell. In fact, as long as you refuse to acknowledge me and deal severely with me, you are in hell. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. Let's stand and lift our hands and worship the Lord. Oh, brethren, I really don't mind telling you that I struggle with pride every day. Every day of my life. Every single day of my life. I struggle with it. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. There's nothing that defiles me as much as pride. It burns me in my prayer. Sometimes when I kneel before God, I am afflicted because of the pride that is in me. And I, until I did this study, I didn't know how proud I was. And I, I have learned now to look past all that people say about me because I know the real me. No, you have to know the real you, folks. Well, we're going to pursue this for a few weeks. And see where the Lord takes us with it. I'm, it, it, it ravished me so much, this study that I did. And I said, well, I, it was just a personal study. And then I just said, you know what, I'm going to share it with the church. See if it will help us. Oh God, let's, let's just... Just lift your voice and talk to the Lord for a minute about this. So, Lord, wash me. Just, just take this stinking pride out of my life. This desire to be first. This desire to have the preeminence. This desire to be known. This hunger to be acknowledged. This, this this vexation when my name is not called. This anger when I'm overlooked. Take it from me.
I want to be irresistible to God. I want God to regard me. I want God to draw near to me. I don't want God to resist me. I don't want to pray for three hours thinking that I'm touching God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Brethren, I don't need to tell you, right? You, these Bible studies that we do, you know that I'm not, I'm not that gifted to generate all this information on my own, right? <laughs> Much of the information or the thoughts of others, I'm, I don't make any boast that all, everything in here are my thoughts. So, you know, I'm... May the Lord help us to, to be broken in his presence. May he help us. I guess it's, it's so easy when we are confronted with, you know, truth and so easy for us to become defensive and uh, not respond appropriately. It's, it's human almost. But I um, have, to, have to find that place of humility. I'm going to ask you to be seated for a minute. Um, tomorrow evening, the leaders of fellowship ministry, we are to meet tomorrow at 6.30 in the conference room. On Friday at 6.30, the leaders of stewardship meeting with us in the conference room. And then on Saturday at 11 a.m., Leaders of worship ministry are meeting with you on Saturday at 11 a.m. after funeral service for Brother Foskin. And uh, we, the persons expected to attend are the pastoral assistant assigned to the ministry, the ministry leader, the assistant ministry leaders, the secretary, and the person who is coordinating each sub-ministry. Uh, brethren, we want to be uh, supporting the, the Nanneville Outstation on Friday. They were, they're having Youth Week. 
and we want to be going there on Friday at 6.30 and also on Sunday evening at 6.30 all roads lead to the Backbush Community uh, Center which is where we will be going for the Sunday evening service and I'd like for all of us to support that service in the Backbush community, right? Funeral service for Brother Forskin will be held here uh, at 9 a.m. on Saturday. And uh, the interment will be in St. Elizabeth. If you want to go, please contact Brother Steve Allen. Uh, the cost is $1,000 per person. All past and current members and interested persons are being invited to attend the Loving Arms General Meeting this Saturday at 12 noon in the Ralph and Helen Reynolds Hall. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Project Hope Foundation invites suitably qualified persons to fill the positions of camp director, assistant camp director, uh, events planning and production for its 2014 summer day camp. You are to submit your resumes to Project Hope Foundation Summer Day Camp 2014, 72 and a half, Wildman Street, Kingston, or email pentaprojecthope at yahoo.com by March 31st, 2014. Applications are invited to fill the position of accounting clerk at Pentecostal Tabernacle. A minimum of two years' experience as an accounting clerk with five. CSEC level subjects. What is CSEC? Isn't that CXE? CSEC, that's right? Okay, so there's no more CXE. It's the same thing? Okay. And CAPE, units one and two in accounts. Submit applications to Mrs. Diane Beach, a corporate services manager. Pentecostal Tabernacle or via email pentabadmin at cwjamaica.com by March 25th, 2014. And these um, notices will be on the notice board for further details. Brethren, this evening we want to receive a very special offering. Very, very special offering. Very, very, very special offering. Very, very, very special offering. And uh, brethren, you know, sometimes we can't say much about these very, very special offerings. But uh, this very, very special offering is to help somebody who is in urgent need. And so we want to ask you to uh, give a very, very, very special offering. Amen? Amen? All right. I'm going to ask the ushers to come and receive this very, very, very special offering. Very, very, very special offering. Please give a very, very, very special offering. Combine choir practice at six tomorrow evening. Uh, folks, 
I'm, I'm just wondering if we should have a bus going to Nannyville. We should have a bus going to Nannyville on, on Friday, you think so? Yes? All right. Those who would like for us to provide a bus to go to Nannyville for the services on Friday and Sunday, it's going to cost $200 return. Would this, and you're sure you're going to go unless you are dead. Would you stand, please? Because would you stand, please? Those who are sure. All right. Friday's out. Friday's out. We can't provide a bus for five persons. So you're going to have to try and make your own way, brethren. Uh, and we check on Sunday to see for those who would like a bus to go on. On Sunday, amen? It could be that more and more of us are driving now. And it could be too that more of us are trying to walk so that we can uh, get some exercise. I hate to think of the final alternative that some of us just not going. I, 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 is that it? <laughs> oh, let's stand and lift our hands. And say, help me, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. So we're going to go, brethren. We're going to go. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, all those children will be sitting GSAT tomorrow. Just run up here. All of you will be sitting GSAT tomorrow. Just run up here. Oh, they're going to sleep. All right, that's fine. All right. Times have changed in the church. 20 years ago, that, that would be the time to come to church. Oh, here are some. Some are wonderful, 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 wonderful. We thank God for our children. I need some of you who care about children to come and lay hands on one of these children. Please, please come. Those of you who care for children and you'd like for these children to do well. And you have a concern. You'll pray for them as if they were your child. As if they were your child. Praise God. Let's talk to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we stand in your presence feeling a great sense of our own unworthiness. We realize, Lord, that you are the one who made us worthy. You are the one who gave us a hope. If we have a song today, you are the one who gave us a song. You put a song in our hearts, a song of praise. We used to sing different songs, but now our songs are songs of praise and adoration. Lord, we pray that you would help us to renounce every arrogant way, every proud way, every high-minded thought and humble us, Lord, in your presence. Teach us the way of humility, the way of brokenness, the way of vulnerability, 
the way of walking softly before you oh god we don't want you to resist us we don't want you to keep us far from you we want you to bring us in and embrace us oh god have mercy upon us remember our precious children some are here some are not here who will be sitting the gsat exam tomorrow oh god breathe upon them in a very special way even now wrap your arms around them lord give them a restful night wake them up with fresh minds and clear thoughts when they go into the examination room lord go in with them quicken their minds god oh god the things that they have studied remind them of everything lord help them to excel lord in the name of jesus remove fear and anxiety and doubt oh god oh god breathe upon the parents oh god in the name of jesus help them not to pressure the children too much oh god relieve the parents of the tension and the agony help them to trust you lord lord we're praying for all our children oh god those in the extension schools those in the community sunday schools remember them this night lord in the name of jesus show yourself strong on their behalf oh god we commit them into your hands as we go we ask you to go with us and ask you to remember us lord keep our hearts and minds in the love of god we commit ourselves into your hands lord we rejoice in you in your name we will set up our banners hear our petitions lord let our cry come unto thee remember us we are weak and need your help bless the offering that has been received help us to use it for your honor and glory in jesus name amen uh, please Walk around, brethren, and share a precious moment with one or two of the saints.